I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Brand new trial starting here on your front row seat to justice. And this one um, is related to a series on Netflix called Take Care of Maya. Um, this is a heartbreaking story, a tragic story for a family, but now it's, it's a trial. It's not a criminal trial. It's a civil trial. But it's, it's a family that has endured what no family uh, should ever have to endure. The question is, is the hospital they're suing responsible for what happened? It's a layered, complicated story, so I'll let Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter tell you all about it right now. October 16th, 2016, Jack and Beata Kowalski took their 10-year-old daughter, Maya, to the Children's Hospital in Sarasota, Florida. Maya was complaining of severe stomach pains and her parents were concerned that she was having a relapse of a debilitating condition she had been struggling with for more than a year, complex regional pain syndrome. According to MayoClinic.org, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, or CRPS, is a form of chronic pain that can affect the arms and legs and can cause continuous burning or throbbing pain, swelling, skin lesions, or sensitivity to touch or cold. Maya's mother, Beata, was a registered nurse and had spent months in 2015 researching her daughter's symptoms and consulting with doctors before Maya was diagnosed with CRPS. Maya's medical journey was documented in the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. So let's go over your history just a little bit, okay? Approximately three months ago, you started having some pain down in your feet here. Throughout the fall of 2015 and 2016, Maya was treated by doctors who used extremely high doses of ketamine to manage her symptoms. According to the DEA, ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic that has some hallucinogenic effects, but can give relief from chronic pain conditions. When Maya began complaining of stomach pains in October 2016, her father took her to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, where she had been treated five times before. The first nurse in triage had no idea what CRPS was. And then the other ones as well. I got my wife on the phone and she talked to the doctor. The payments are low dose naltrexone and ketamine oral prescribed by her doctor. The Netflix documentary details how the treating physicians in the emergency room were alarmed that Maya was being treated with ketamine and suspected she was being medically abused. Her concern was merely administering ketamine over and over, more and more and more. The hospital filed a report with Florida's Department of Children and Family Services, and Maya was sheltered at Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital for three months. There are risk of respiratory failure, cardiac arrest. Her daughter could die from this, and it didn't seem that she was, you know, worried about that. Hospital staff accused Beata of having Munchausen by proxy syndrome and that she was intentionally making Maya sick. Maya's mother was never allowed to visit her while the case was being investigated. And Netflix's Take Care of Maya highlights how her calls to Maya were monitored by a social worker. Hi, Beata? Yes, this is Beata. Okay, I have um, Maya on the phone. Hi, how is my sunshine today? I miss you so much, Mommy. I do too, sweetie pie. I do too. I miss you so much. We just have to be patient, okay? Beata Kowalski died by suicide 87 days after Maya was admitted to the hospital and taken into state custody. She left a suicide note blaming the doctors at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and Florida's Department of Children and Families. A year after Beata Kowalski's death, Maya's father filed a civil suit against Johns Hopkins seeking up to $200 million. The lawsuit accuses the hospital of negligence, false reporting, and causing emotional distress when Beata and Jack Kowalski were accused of abusing Maya. 
Johns Hopkins has denied the allegations in their court filings and emphasized their responsibility as mandatory reporters to protect any child that they believe might be at risk of injury or death. It's really confusing to me how a child who's being cared for by a physician and then ends up in an emergency room and then, then there's all this confusion about what's going on and this, this blame being pointed at, at, the, at the parents. I mean, it, it, I don't know exactly how all this happened. Now, the trial has started opening statements today. Let's take a look. The evidence will ultimately show that these doctors and these nurses and this hospital staff acted reasonably and prudently to treat a difficult and challenging case they were presented with, and they did it consistently over three months. They don't have to be right under the law. All they have to be is reasonable. And we suggest to you the evidence will show that first, they probably were right, but even if they weren't, they were more than reasonable. Maya Kowalski was falsely imprisoned and battered. She was denied communication with her family. She was denied communication with the outside. She was told that her mother was crazy. She was told by social workers that one in particular, she would be her mother. She was put into a room and left for 42 hours with the commode just out of reach because the hospital wanted to prove that she could actually get up and walk. By January 13th, when Maya was finally left out of the hospital, unsurprisingly, this family was a wreck. Maya was not let out of the hospital even after her mother committed suicide on January 7th of 2017. The continued allegations that she was crazy and that she was trying to harm her own children, both Kyle and Maya, and the systematic, the knowledge of the systematic abuse of her child in the hospital caused her, at the end, to lose completely and utterly her ability to control the maternal instinct, and that that outweighed the survival instinct. In the process, they caused Beata Kowalski her life, denied Jack a loving wife, denied both Kyle and Maya a loving, caring, and amazing mother. They caused just terrific and permanent psychological injury, as one may expect. And there inside the courtroom, that's Maya. Can you imagine what she is going through? In, in all of this, but this family is bringing this action. They want what they believe is their sense of justice for what happened to Maya, what happened to her mom, what happened to this family. And yes, it's a $200 million lawsuit, but many times in civil cases, it's about more. It's about getting your opportunity to prove to yourself, prove to the world, um, what you're saying is true. And I think that's part of the motivation of this family. Um, now, again, it's, it's a lawsuit, so ultimately, it's a civil case. This will be about uh, uh, money and liability, et cetera. Here's what Johns Hopkins is saying. <clears throat> Our priority at John, this is part of their statement. It was a very long statement, but this is the, the, the most significant parts of it. Our priority at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital is always the safety and privacy of our patients and their families, and we are vigorously defending against the false allegations made in the suit. Our first responsibility is always to the child brought to us for care, and we stand behind our staff's compassionate care. It is DCF and a judge not Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, that investigates the situation and makes the ultimate decision about what course of action is in the best interest of the child. We look forward to demonstrating to the court and jury that all of the appropriate and legally required processes were followed by our staff. So that's what they're saying. Bunch of things struck me from the opening statements that we just heard. Like, we don't, they don't have to be right. The hospital doesn't have to be right. 
But the problem is, is that DCF and the judge is listening to what the hospital's saying. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. This is a, this is a tough one. Uh, joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklyn Mercy. Also with us in Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias. Doesn't like her. Kirk Nurmi and Holly Davis joining us from Austin, Texas tonight. Great to see you, Holly. All right. There we go. Let's, uh, um, Eklund, this, yes. now obviously this is, um, it's getting a lot of publicity through the Netflix series, but this trial will take it to the next level. And I, I believe this family wants everyone to watch this trial for what happened. W what are your thoughts about what this trial is about and, and what it will be like? Unfortunately, as a criminal defense attorney and personal injury attorney, I have seen this happen more often than not. Um, it'll be one bad decision or one employee away from your whole lives completely changing. It's really unfortunate what we have here, but often I see when a medical professional's opinion um, sometimes is being questioned, the moment it's being questioned, um, everybody's on the defense. Nobody's really focused on the task at hand. Everybody is trying to more, more so double down on the decision. They're digging in, they they're made. digging in. How dare yeah. you question me? I'm a doctor, and, and I'm a nurse, you don't question you. me. So like your interactions are essentially being cut by, or uh, essentially you're talking to somebody's ego, somebody's trauma, somebody's childhood, you know, inner child. You're talking to all these people in a highly emotional state. And still we don't have systems and procedures in place to have the checks and balances when things like this happen. Kirk, um, you know, I think everyone was struck by Maya inside that courtroom today, and she'll be there. Um, this has to be incredibly difficult for her, but I, I think ultimately she may be the key to all of this in, in what she recalls and in, in what happened um, to her during these three months. Yeah, ultimately, Vinny, this is probably going to be a tough thing for her to relive right she's already been through so much in her life and now here she is at this young age reliving this this tragedy that befell her mother but she's also going to be the key to this case because she does drive the emotion of the case right because this story isn't just heartbreaking it's anger inducing because while john hopkins is right they do have an obligation to protect the children let's not lose sight of the fact that one of the allegations is pretty clear there was a false report, right? I mean, they talked to her treating physician. They understood, they were given direction on what, how she was being treated and it was consistent with what the mother and what the family was telling them all along. And they decided whether it was ego or not, probably Eklund's right on that point. They decided, no, that's not right. Then they bring in a state investigator who ignores the consultation she had with Maya's treating physician and goes forward and begins to initiate legal processes. So, you know, John Hopkins is certainly cannot hide behind protecting the children. They were the ones, the doctors involved, the nurses involved who were ignorant to this. They let their ignorance move forward. And I, I look forward to my taking the stand. I hope it's cathartic for her and I hope the family gets every penny and whatever else they need out of this trial. Holly, um, so the hospital, we don't have to be right. And it's not us, it's the judge in DCF. What, what do you think of that as uh, their defense to what happened to this family? I don't personally like the defense where you go like this, it wasn't me, it was someone else. I think that's a weak defense position in a civil lawsuit. I think that there's a huge difference for this hospital between a duty to report, which they all have, which I have, and it's a very serious duty. There's a difference between a duty to report abuse and absolutely influencing the course of the investigation. You can't simultaneously be the person reporting abuse and also participating as like um, a judge or an influencer of the actual investigation. And that's exactly what happened. 
So I think this is going to be a fascinating wake up call to hospitals. And I think that civil lawsuits do such a great job of sending a message to other people that there has to be a boundary between reporting what you believe could be child abuse and absolutely blowing through every bit of neutral and objectively verifiable data point that showed that this child was not the victim of Munchausen by proxy. Eklund Mercy, they're telling her that her mother is crazy. A 10-year-old girl, you're telling her. Yeah. And, and we heard on that phone call, I mean, 10-year-old girl wants to be with her mommy. They're, they all should be fired, like every single last one of them, all of them. Um, unfortunately, though, um, caseworkers, uh, they do not get paid that much, I will have to say that. And although we have a lot that are very passionate about children that are very, you know, passionate about their jobs, we have a lot that aren't. And it's not their fault. There's not that many um, uh, requirements for certain caseworkers in certain states. A lot of states, the requirements do not include um, really investigate, like um, deep diving in what evidence is and the difference between direct and circumstantial and what they need to be looking at in um, making investigations. So I think it's a systematic issue that this case will highlight and hopefully uh, it, it will make a change. But I am shocked that they're only going for two mil. I no, no, 200 million, 200 million, it's 200. 200, it's 200. Oh, it's 200. 200. It's 200. It's not two. two let's say that, yes, okay. yes, they deserve all of it, yes. 